Okay. So tonight it's our first Ignite talk sessions. And so we have two Ignite talk sessions. So who knows what is an Ignite talk? Okay, so for the rest, that's, uh, the idea is basically that uh, those uh, heroes, uh, those speakers will have uh, 20 slides, 15 seconds per slide, and they will tell you a story in five minutes. And so, of course, so that's the topics of, to, of, of tonight. Uh, you won't know everything about these topics uh, after the five minutes, but that's, uh, the, the idea today is really to have a, an introduction of, the, of those topics and that you can identify the people who are in charge of those topics and then uh, we start a conversation. We start a conversation that will continue at the reception. We start a conversation that will continue tomorrow. And um, that's, uh, I think that's uh, the best way to, to know, to get a better understanding of what's happening uh, at the foundation, on the foundation, Eclipse Foundation side right now, in terms of uh, how we market the ID as a product, how, what, what's new for intellectual property uh, processes and intellectual property uh, uh, management with lots of shiny things. Also, um, what is the proposal of uh, three software stacks for, for IoT, uh, IoT solutions? What we do in CBI, so what is CBI? That's common build infrastructure. So what do we do in the... <laughs> <laughs> what do we do to build all the projects at Eclipse? And the last topic is not from, uh, from the Eclipse Foundation, but it's uh, from Roberto Di Cosmo, uh, who is uh, the leader of a very interesting uh, project called Software Heritage, which is, which is uh, about uh, the preservation of software commons. So I won't be too long because we don't, them too much, we don't give them too much time, so it's would not fair to be too long. Uh, and let's start with uh, Wayne Beaton for uh, the Eclipse ID is a product. Thanks. No, please. I, I, I am not a hero. Uh, I'm just a guy uh, doing his best to, to do a good job. Um, uh, are, you, are, you, are you almost ready? I'm almost ready. Just hit control L when you're ready and it'll start. Oh, okay. Just a guy doing, okay. Control L. So, uh, for years we have basically denied that the Eclipse IDE is a product. Historically, it wasn't, really. We started off with this SDK, the Software Development Kit. People would go to our site and they would download it and uh, add, install a Java ID into it and pull a bunch of pieces together and hope that something coherent came out of that. But over time, this has changed. We now have a downloads page with a bunch of IDE downloads. One of the reasons historically that we didn't do things called products was because when you create a product, you imply certain things like support. Uh, you imply certain things like a coherent story. Well, we have a coherent story now with the packages. Support is still another question, but we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. One of the things I'd like you to take away, though, as a developer of Eclipse software, is that by and large, most of our users don't really care about open source. Really, all they want to do is get their job done. And if your software gets their job done, they will continue to use your software. We really need to stop asking our community of users, where's the patch? When one of our community members has the, 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 the guts to show up to one of our Eclipse projects and ask a question, chances are they're probably just a user and they don't have the skills to provide us with a patch. One of the things that's frustrated me over the years is what do we call this? Many people refer to the Eclipse IDE as simply Eclipse, but many things are Eclipse. The Eclipse Foundation, uh, the Eclipse Project, but what we have on our download pages are the Eclipse IDEs, and we have multiple editions of them. Uh, it's not the Eclipse Oxygen, it is the Eclipse IDE Oxygen Edition. Similarly, we have 
one logo for everything. Uh, the logo can be confusing. Is it the platform? Is it the IDE? Is it the Eclipse Foundation? Well, frankly, it happens to be all of the above. How confusing can that be to users? The fact of the matter is that the Eclipse development process defines a process for building products in open source. We have an IP process that is the envy of many professional organizations. We have uh, a process of doing releases with rigor that, again, is an envy of many professional organizations. That we are able to produce software on time every year with the features, more or less, that we promise, uh, is, is great. As developers, we need to think about the users. And one of the things that we need to do is make sure that we integrate seamlessly. For one thing, our project names, <laughs> I'm in sync, our project names are code names. Um, the eGit project does a wonderful job of, of this. You never see the word eGit in the UI anywhere, except maybe the about screen. You see Git integration or team integration with Git. It's all basically about the task. What does the user want to do? The user wants to do Git things, not eGit things. And I think that's a great model that we need to follow. Project teams need to support the user community. One of the ways that we do this is going out to where the user community lives. The user community may live in a Google group. They may live uh, in our forums. They probably don't but they may live in um, Stack Overflow. We need to, as developers, find those people and work with them. I love this Eclipse Java IDE Twitter account. They're meeting the community where it is on Twitter and providing very regular updates of cool things you can do in Eclipse. If you do not follow uh, at Eclipse Java IDE, uh, please start, uh, and uh, we need to make sure everybody else does that too. Also, use Eclipse Marketplace. Um, the problem reporter. I love this error reporter. Uh, it's a great thing. If it comes up on your screen, please use it. At the same time, if it comes up when the user is doing normal user things, that's a little bit jarring. Make sure that your software doesn't bring the user error dialog up when it doesn't make any sense. Make records or make entries in Eclipse Marketplace. Oh, and oh, I guess they're moving on. Java 9 support. Try it out. Go to Eclipse Marketplace. Try the Java 9 support. Do it now. The Java ID Twitter is not run by me, so you'll get actual good advice. Back to you. So the next one, and okay, so the next one is uh, Eclipse Intellectual Property, an era of change by Sharon Corbett from uh, the IP team of the Eclipse Foundation. Go. Welcome, I'm Sharon. For those that uh, do not know me or haven't had uh, the good fortune to deal with us at the IP team at the Eclipse Foundation, um, this presentation will be particularly interested for committers and project leads or anyone coming to the Eclipse Foundation with a new project. I will talk today about the significant IP changes we've been making at the Foundation. These changes are being made for a variety of reasons, but most importantly for you, our community, and your projects. We are now offering dual IP review streams. We have an option that is a license compatibility check only. This is very efficient, and we continue to have our regular IP review practice. This is what a committer sees when he or she chooses the type of IP review that they desire for their project. As you can see, each type is clearly defined. So what do we need to know about type A IP review, which is a license check? It is only for third-party dependencies. It does not apply to your project code. It's a project decision whether you want to opt in, and there are no barriers. Projects may remain type A forever. Projects may be hybrid, contain both type A and B release IP. Projects may change the release type as they mature, and new projects will receive type A for onboarding purposes. Whoops. 
This is an IP log, uh, an example of a type A release. You'll see that it has license compatibility certification only, and it includes the license certified dependencies that have been IP checked. Did you know that we apply diff review exceptions to previously approved third party dependencies now? In fact, we have eliminated the requirement for IP review for revisions of third party service release diff reviews. An example of this would be a rev of a third party library from 1.2.4 to 1.2.5 that only contains bug fixes or service fixes. No CQ or IP ticket is required. And we have significantly reduced our review investment in minor releases. The time has long since passed to update the Eclipse Guide to Legal Doc. The current documentation guidelines are concerned with the distribution of Eclipse platform plugins and features only. Standards and conventions have evolved as well as technology. Further, we have Eclipse Foundation projects that are no longer EPL only licensed. We are currently working to update the guide in order to provide templates and guidance to these projects. As well, we are working on providing alternate copyright and license headers and notice files. <clears throat> For new projects that are not plugin based, this is what we are anticipating to meet new compliance requirements. We will also be adhering to the SPDX specification, which is the standard format for com communicating the components, licenses, and copyrights associated with software packages. It provides a standard set of codes for specifying license information, as well as the syntax for describing licenses and how they are combined. <laughs> Here's an example um, of <clears throat> including an SPDX license identifier in a copyright and license header. As you can see here, the SPDX identifier for the Eclipse public license is the EPL 1.0. <laughs> and here's a sneak preview of the alternate copyright and license headers we are working on. You will note here that the copyright is to the contributors of the Eclipse Foundation. Should a project wish to use this alternate header, the project must include and maintain copyright information in a notice file. And here is what we're planning for the sneak preview of what the notice file would look at. This is what the format would include. Coming soon, we are working towards automating for type, a tool within IPZilla for type A CQs where the tool will run and report licenses found and then check those licenses against a whitelist with the goal of license certifying type A CQs automatically. And finally, version 2.0 of the Eclipse public license has just been submitted for certification as an open source license with the OSI. Version 2 of the EPL has been primarily created for you here in Europe. And anyone who would like to discuss the EPL2 should seek out our executive director, Mike Malinkovich, who has been spearheading this endeavor all the way. Thank you. Okay. I, no, I don't know how it works. You do? Oh, that's your computer. It's in my computer. Well, let's, let, let's give it a shot. Uh, it's already there. Okay. Okay. So now, so, Jan Spirit for the three stacks required for IoT solutions. Control L? <laughs> then what? That was awesome, Sharon, by the way. So it was really good. So I hate going third. I, th I thought like, okay, I can show up, Sharon. But no, that was great. So, so I'm gonna talk about IoT um, and what we've been doing in the, the Eclipse community. Um, I guess kind of first of all, hopefully everyone's heard about IoT. It's kind of, there's a ton of hype. Um, lots of kind of big, big hockey stick graphs of connectivity of, of devices, um, revenue graphs that, that come out. So there's lots of discussion. If you go to Twitter, because Twitter is the source of all news now, there's Twitter um, IDs for smart manufacturing, citizens. There's also a Twitter ID for the internet of shit of all the crappy devices that are gonna be built in because of IoT, um, so it's great. But really what IoT is about is, is how do you connect devices, kind of sensors and actuators to some type of gateway 
that really feeds the, the, the information into the network, um, into the cloud backend to do the application integration. Um, and so I think kind of one of the things that we're, we all see is that kind of software is eating the world. So how do we start thinking about software for IoT? So software starts to eat, eat IoT, um, IoT. And the thing is, from an open source perspective, how do you start thinking about what are the core building blocks that you need for building IoT solutions? I think you need to start to think about kind of the LAMP stack for IoT. Right? Everyone knows what LAMP means when, when you're doing a web application, you know what LAMP is. So what is the LAMP for, for IoT? Well, I think you actually need to think about three different stacks for IoT. One for kind of, kind of the constrained devices. So how do you kind of program an MCU in, in an efficient way? How do you connect and manage that, in, that MCU? Then on the gateway, how do you take the, the, the gateway and, and have the application smarts out at the edge? How do you manage the network? How do you manage the data going to the, up to the, through the network when the network's down? So how do you persist it? Um, how do you kind of remote management and update those, uh, those stacks? And then on the back end, how do you do things like device management? How do you do things like route, uh, message routing? Um, and from an application perspective, how do you integrate all this information into, into your applications? So if you think about the stacks that kind of, kind of from, from an open perspective, what you need to make sure they're open. You don't want to get locked into a proprietary stacks and silos, which a lot of vendors are out there trying, trying to do. So these are some of the characteristics that you should look at. If I had more than 15 seconds, I would have gone through them, but, but I don't. So, so in, within the Clips IRT community, we are starting to address these three stacks uh, of software, and we've been working on this for over five years, and hopefully some of you have been participating and known, known what we do. But we're up to 27 projects, lots of uh, nice logos, lots of weird names, um, but what we try now to do is map these projects across the, across the three stacks. Um, it's not perfect. We don't have all the building blocks, but we're getting there. So if you look at the constrained devices, we have a, a project called Edge, which is a set of Java APIs for doing GPIO and hardware extraction. Paho and, Light, and Wakayama for doing MQTT and, and lightweight MFM for constrained devices. For the, for the gateway, we have um, projects like Eclipse Smart Home for doing a smart home gateway. Clip Secure for doing industrial gateways. We have an application runtime, so a very small OSGI framework called, called Concierge that you can use to build gateways. And then on the back end is, is really where the heart of the community is, is emerging, um, where we have, have projects like Mosquito for doing MQTT, uh, Lesson for doing lightweight M2M, Hawkbit for doing software deployment. It's extensive. So what we try and do is, there's a lot there, we try and make it really easy, we have a nice developer portal, we have white papers, so this whole presentation is in a 15 page white paper, not a 15 second slide, we have getting started. Um, so I'd encourage you to go and look at, at, at the, uh, the site. If you want to try it out, you don't have to set up a lot of the servers. We have sandbox servers. So if you want to experiment with co-op or, or MQTT or lightweight m 10 we have a sandbox servers for each one of those that you can, can use. Um, we're also starting to do test beds. So we have companies coming together and say, okay, how do we bring together an IoT solution to, to solve things like asset tracking or smart man manufacturing? Um, so it's an important part of our community is trying to kind of show a complete test um, scenario for, for IoT. We have over 30 members. Um, the nice thing is we have companies in the OT side, so companies like Bosch, com companies on the IT side like um, Red Hat um, that are really bringing this forward. So join us, use, use the project, experiment, buy for Raspberry Pi, try it out, start a project, contribute, join the, join the working group, join the, one of the test beds. That's my pack. that's it. Okay, so next one is Fred Guru about the CBI land, the common build infrastructure, the story of the common build infrastructure at Liquid Foundation. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Fred. I'm the dedicated release engineer working at the Eclipse Foundation, and I'm going to talk about news from the CBI land. Uh, what is CBI? Some infrastructure issues that some of you might have experienced, and um, the hip to chip project, and also what's coming in the future in CBI land. So for those of, the, of you what, who don't know what CBI is, uh, CBI stands for Common Built Infrastructure. 
and um, it defines tech, uh, technologies and practices uh, how you can um, build, test, deploy, and deliver Eclipse-based software. So uh, at its core, it's using Maven and Tyco, uh, but it also uses tools like Hudson and, and later on Jenkins, um, uh, Git and Garrett, uh, and also uh, Nexus and Sonacube. Some of those services uh, are provided by the Eclipse Foundation. We host uh, some of those services. And um, unfortunately, in, uh, yeah, in the past, we had some, some infrastructure issues that affected some of the projects. Uh, uh, and yeah, we, we are kind of uh, a victim of our own success because we have an increased demand for those services. And um, yeah, just limited hardware and limited resources uh, in the IT department. So uh, yeah, we struggle a bit, but uh, we try to uh, get it fixed. Uh, one of the biggest issues we had in the past was the proxy, which uh, was in front of our build environment. And um, instead of helping us and reducing load or reducing download uh, things, uh, it turned out to be a configuration nightmare. It's, it's very hard to debug, and uh, there are uh, all different places where you have to configure it. Uh, for example, in, you have to configure it in Hudson and Jenkins itself. Then for all the tools that you're using, uh, like Ant, Maven, uh, Git, NPM, Gradle, whatever you use, uh, and also on the command line, uh, for example, in, in environment variables like HTTP underscore proxy, you have to define it everywhere, and yeah, it can just be redundant and uh, yeah, hard to, hard to find where the problem is. Um, so we decided to let the build environment bypass the proxy it's still in place, so nothing breaks, but uh, it's deprecated. Nexus, our second uh, biggest problem uh, in the past was, uh, yeah, really crashing at random times, and we did not know where, uh, uh, didn't know why, sorry, and um, I, I'm close to writing even a book about it. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's hosted, it's a VM hosted on, on Xen, and it, when it crashed, it did not leave any traces in the logs. And uh, we were just, most of the time, we were just able to restart it and, and hope for it to keep running. Um, finally, in the, at the end of March, we had some, or we found some new hardware. Uh, and um, now it's uh, stable and the uptime is up to, uh, since yesterday, 85 days. So it's, it's good. Um, the hip to jib project is based uh, around the fact that uh, Hudson and its plugins are no longer maintained, and therefore we have to replace it with Jenkins. Um, we started in the beginning of this year uh, to not longer provision any Hudson servers for new projects. Instead, we only provision Jenkins. And um, for existing projects that use Hudson, we will have a migration path where a script tries to transform the configurations for each job as close as possible to Jenkins. And we will start with some guinea pig projects uh, in the next weeks and uh, roll it out to the rest uh, of projects in the near future. So what else is planned for the future? Obviously, we will try to have less, less downtime, hopefully new hardware, and um, yeah, try to have um, yeah, the projects be more self-service uh, self so they can do some stuff on their own. Um, and we will try to roll out some cool features uh, like support for Docker uh, in combination with Jenkins and also some uh, often requested features uh, like uh, the Jenkins um, uh, pipelines, uh, which will yeah, hopefully increase also the uh, productivity of all Eclipse projects. Thank you very much. So, so you now identified some faces of uh, the Eclipse Foundation and the, the projects they, they work on. Uh, so now it's time to switch to maybe a bigger, a larger project, because uh, my colleagues at uh, Eclipse, it, they, they improve and, uh, and change our processes or products or stuff like that, but 
Roberto is working on something much bigger, which is, uh, to some extent, uh, changing the world of uh, software for the, for the best for the future. So, Roberto, go. Ah, thanks okay. to come. Thanks for this time. Okay, hi everybody, my name is Roberto Di Crossman. I'm particularly excited to come here to talk about Software Heritage, a, a, a project which is actually trying to build a universal software archive and knowledge base. And by the way, try to squeeze three years of work in five minutes, Let, let's try to do it. Okay. If we look around us, we see software everywhere. It powers our industry, fuels innovation, immediate access to digital information is a pillar of modern research. In a world, is a core of our knowledge today. But as we all know, knowledge is in the source code. And where is the source code? If you look more closely, you will see it is actually spread all around. We use tons of different infrastructure to develop, distribute, share, download the source code. There are so many around. Some were very popular 10 years ago, and this spread disappeared. Some are very popular today, who knows where we'll be in 10 years. Basically, we don't have a universal catalog of all the source code which is available worldwide. And things are actually getting worse because software source code, like all digital information, is fragile. Of course, you know, you can make a mistake, RM minus RF in the wrong directory. That's the reason why you need to have a backup. But it's worse than that. Look at what happened with Google Code or Gitorios a few years ago. I mean, 1 million, 500,000 projects needed to migrate in a few months because somebody just decided to shut down a development platform. We are basically missing an archive of our source code. That's, there, are, there are just two reasons of why we decided to launch a project which is called Software Heritage, whose mission is precisely to collect, preserve, and share all the source code which is publicly available worldwide. Well, this is not just slideware, okay? We already started the work a bunch of time ago. We have a full up-to-date mirror of GitHub, Debian, GNU, and yes, even Gitorios and Google Code. We managed to salvage them before they were shut down. Bitbucket is work in progress in plan to get everything possible. Here are some numbers which seem kind of impressive. Three billion unique source code files, more than 60 million project indexed today and counting. And we are not just building an archive, it's more than that. I mean, for Git users, we are building a, big, a Git at the scale of the planet, a gigantic Merkle tree that shares everything which is developed today. Why is this relevant for industry? We believe it actually, this will allow to build better software for industry and society. A unique entry point where you can discover, search, find, all source code, a unique way of tracing software development, simplifying supply chain, for example. Think about you, what you could do with a reference platform for big code today. Right? So it's, we already do all the right work for you to do machine learning, big data, mining, etc. How are we doing all this? So we focus on the basic units philosophy. We just take care of the infrastructure, software heritage, keep your source code, talk to everybody, cultural heritage, industry, research, education, to make sure they have what they need. And we build our infrastructure on two sound principles. Everything we do is open source. We work very transparently. And since we are here for the own whole, I'm not a startup, I'm not a project. We are building a foundation and we need help from everybody. This means sharing our vision, and I'm particularly grateful to the Clips Foundation for being one of the first ones who actually decided to share our vision. There are many others that follow suit. And we need also resources to do this. In RIA, in, in France, decided to start the project and fund its initial effort, like they did it on W3C many years ago. Other companies did follow suit, but you see there is a lot of empty space there. So if your company is not there, it should be. Okay, so just take a few moments and come to talk to us to see how they can come in. But it's not just about the money, it's about awareness. Make sure everybody knows software is important, must be protected, must be developed in a better way. That's the reason why a couple of months ago we managed to sign an agreement with UNESCO and the presidents of high political authorities on software preservation and access that raises the importance of our source code at the highest political levels. So let me finish this with a simple message. This is just not a project, not a single person, single team uh, uh, undertaking. This is a common mission. So please come in, 
we are open. If you have money, we will take it. If you have time, we will take it. If you have knowledge, we will take it. If you want to code, please come in. Everything is open. Uh, if you don't have any, anything else to say, just share the word. And I will be here. Don't take, uh, take the chance. We will, I am ready to chat to anybody who wants to know more about this. Five minutes? OK, thanks a lot. Good. So I think we are done for today. Thank you very much for uh, being uh, here today and being to, uh, in this session. Uh, again, the, the goal of this session is really to, to give you information to start a conversation. I think that uh, all those topics are important and uh, you really have a unique opportunity to, unique opportunities to, to talk to, to those speakers. So now it's time to... Party. Yes, almost! <laughs> so to go in the hot uh, outside and then uh, let's meet at seven at uh, Novotel Plus Wilson. So Novotel Saint Novotel Hotel Center Place Wilson. So go to Place Wilson and meet you there for drinks and food. See you.